Assignment four, uh, we're, we're getting into chapter nine now, which is all about momentum. Very important idea in physics. So read these two sections. Uh, examples one, two, and four, questions one and three, and then problems one, five, seven, nine, and 11. Now what I'd like to do today is I wanna re review a couple of ideas that we're gonna need. Uh, Newton's second law and Newton's third law. Then we're gonna define what linear momentum is and what we mean by conservation of momentum. And then we're going to develop uh, the idea of impulse. Uh, what is impulse and how does that relate to momentum? So that's kind of the goal today. That's what we're going to do. So let's talk about, let's do a little bit of review, OK? Um, adjust this a little bit. Okay, so we've got, well first let, let's talk about Newton's um, second law. I told you earlier in the year that Newton's second law is basically the net force acting on an object is equal to an object's mass times its acceleration. We're well, going to find out today that that is not the whole story. In fact, it's almost a lie. Sorry, everything you believe is a lie. No, um, this, is <laughs> this is actually true if you assume something about the object that your force is being applied to. For example, that, that the mass is constant. But there are objects where you feel, or situations where you feel a force where the mass is not constant. For example, a rocket. When a rocket is launched, right, it burns its fuel. 90% uh, of the mass of a rocket on a, on a launch pad is fuel. And it very rapidly burns that fuel up. And so as the rocket is launched, it's getting lighter and lighter and lighter. So how does this apply to a situation like that. Also, have you ever uh, had a nozzle uh, on a hose and you, you turn the water on full blast so it comes out really, really fast out through the nozzle? What do you feel on that hose? That hose is going to push back on you, right? You've experienced that? In fact, firefighters have to be very careful because the force of, of stuff, you know, the force produced by the water coming out the end of that fire hose produces a force that can kill them. You know, it takes two firefighters and they have to control that thing. If they let go of it and that thing starts whipping around, it's been known to, you know, really injure or, or kill people. So um, there are situations where uh, mass is important. The mass is not constant. So we're going we're gonna to end up dealing with, with, you know, be able to deal with that. Uh, Newton's third law okay, basically uh, says that, it, that a, for, a force is an interaction between two different objects. And those interactions um, are, you know, are equal and opposite. Equal in magnitude, but opposite in direction. Now, for example, and we haven't talked about gravity uh, you know, uh, you know, planets and stars yet. But you know, if you see, you have an object like this, and this could be a, a planet, and maybe over here is the moon of that planet. And this is object one, and this is object two. There's a gravitational attractive force between them, but that force is equal and opposite. So we have the force of object two on object one. Well, that's going to be equal and opposite to the force of object um, the force of object one on two. So these guys here are equal in magnitude, but 
opposite in direction. And so we can say that this force is equal to the opposite of that force. And this is true for all forces in the universe. We've never seen an exception to, to the third law. If you have a force on one object, on some other object somewhere else, you've got to have an equal and opposite force, whether they're in contact or not. These could be two, uh, like two balloons that have a static electric charge on them. And we're going to talk about that second semester. And um, this could have a, you know, a positive charge, and this could have a negative charge, and they're going to attract each other. But that attractive force will be equal and opposite. So we're going to use these two ideas now um, to define momentum. So let me redraw uh, these two objects since I'm going to move up here. So here's object one and object two. And let's say either through gravity or, or some, some kind of force, they're applying, they're applying forces to each other. Well, I just said that the, um, the force of two on one is equal to the opposite direction of the force of one on two. Well, I'm going to rearrange this a little bit. This is the force of two on one. Add the force of one on two to both sides. The force of one on two is equal to zero. Now, here's one way of looking at this little expression right here. Look at these guys. Treat that as your free body diagram or, or just isolate it as a system. Do you see that these two forces cancel each other out, giving zero net force on the overall system? That's what that means. But if you look at, uh, if you treat this as an individual system, this is the net force acting on object one. And this right here, I could do the same thing. This is the net force acting on object two. So these two objects are going to accelerate towards each other. And so I'm going to say that this, ha this has a mass and this has a mass. So I'm going to say, well, this is MA for object one plus MA for object two. So I just took this expression and rewrote it that way because I'm saying this is my whole system. This is the only thing going on here. But what is true about acceleration? We're now going to relate acceleration to velocity. Right? Acceleration is the rate at which velocity changes. So I can say this. This is m1 times v1 dt okay well uh, because you know this uh, dv dt is what defines acceleration well there's no reason to keep the m out here I'm going to put the m inside now inside the derivative. Let's assume that these particles have constant mass, but I can still put them inside that derivative. So this is d dt of m1 v1 plus d dt of m2 v2. And this equals zero. Okay. So I'm just doing a little bit of math here, but it, it all makes sense. Now this derivative, this time derivative is operated on this and on this. And remember the, 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 the derivative of the sum is equal to the sum of the derivatives. So essentially I can kind of factor out the, the derivative operator. And I can just say that d dt is equal to m1 v1 plus m2 v2. And this will equal zero if you have an isolated system. Okay? Now, this is an important quantity. 
Look what I've got here. I've got the mass of object one times its velocity. And remember, this velocity is a vector, plus the mass of object two times its velocity. Um, and notice that when I take the derivative of that sum, I get zero. Well, the derivative of what is equal to zero? A constant. This is profound stuff we, 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 we've arrived at, OK? Look, if I multiply the mass times the velocity of, of, of object one up here, let me zoom out so you can see the whole thing. If I take you know, the, the mass times the velocity of this object plus the mass times the velocity of this, of this object, that sum is going to be a constant if this is an isolated system. Something is being conserved here. Something isn't changing. The mass times the velocity, the velocity of object one is changing, and the mass times the velocity of object two is changing, but when you add them together, they don't change. So this is such an important idea that we get, we're going to give this a name. The mass of an object times its velocity, by definition, is called momentum. And we give it a variable of lowercase p with a vector hat on it. So let me rewrite this. p equals mv. That's an important definition that you need to know. And notice here that if you have an isolated system like this, momentum is conserved. That is, the sum of the momenta, and the plural for momentum is momenta, I think I'm used to saying that right. Anyway, uh, if I add the, the momentum of all the different particles, and here I have a two-particle system, but I, there's no reason I couldn't have three or four or ten or a thousand particles uh, all interacting with each other. But if I define those to be the system, that collection of particles to be the system, and I isolate it from the rest of the universe, then I can say the momentum of that system is conserved. And, and the way we express uh, conservation of momentum, you know, from here, we say that um, the initial momentum of the system, that is, if I add all the momentum, um, if I add the momentum of all the different particles together, it will be equal to the final momentum of your isolated system. This is really a powerful idea for solving many, many different kinds of problems. It, it, whenever I have a system that's isolated, you know, there are no outside forces acting, there's no energy being you know, put in or, or taken out of a system, I can use this idea, I, this can be one of my starting equations. Okay. Um, so that this is right here. This is a statement of conservation of momentum. Yes. This is really this pi is really uh, the momentum, the, the initial momentum of my system, and this is the final momentum of my system. Uh, one other thing to think about here is that, uh, well, let me rewrite the equation. Of M1 V1 plus M2 V2 equals zero. Well, let's operate the derivative back to it. Um, 
Or let's just take a look at d dt of m1 v1. This is, we said before, um, this is the net force acting on object one. Remember that the mass is constant, right? The mass of object one we said was constant. So we can put the m out here and then operate the derivative on, on v and you get a. So that's where the net force equals ma. But that's not how Newton expressed um, the net force. He said, and it's, this, is, this is the complete description of Newton's second law here. The net force acting on an object is equal to the derivative of the object's momentum. This is Newton's second law. The net force on an object will be equal to the rate at which I change the momentum of that object. So think of this, a net force, obviously it makes an object accelerate. And if you think about the mass of an object, okay, then if the mass of an object is constant, then yeah, we're causing that object to accelerate. But let's take a look at what this, what this means uh, here. If we say, oh, well, this is DDT of M times V. Well, this is a product now, right? Mass times velocity. What if you had a system where the mass is changing at a certain rate? Well, the mass isn't constant. Well, I'd have to use the product rule, wouldn't I? So the net force is equal to the first times the derivative of the second plus the second times the derivative of the first. Now, this is the net force acting on an object. This is Caitlin. This is for you. But take a look at this. What if I've got, you know, I've got a, 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 a fire hose here. Okay. And this fire hose has lots and lots of water coming out of it at a high rate. Now, think about this situation. In this situation, there's no change in velocity, is there? I mean, the water's coming through here, and it just leaves out this velocity as a certain velocity, V. But what, it, what do you have? You have a rate of mass coming out of there. So that force of a fire hose that pushes back on you, Here's what it's equal to. It's equal to the velocity of the water coming out of the hose times the rate at which mass comes out of that hose. Kilograms per second. Okay, so it's, um, uh, that will be your force. So there are many situations where, uh, not that many actually, but there's a few situations where um, you know now, uh, where this term is a is a factor in your calculations. Now, what if the mass is constant? What if you have a situation you, you you're applying a force to an object and its mass isn't changing while you apply that net force? If the mass is constant, what is dm dt? It's zero, and so you have mass times dv dt, which is m times a. So the net force equals mass times acceleration. And that's how we usually express Newton's second law. But it's really only true if the mass is a constant. You also have this other term. What if the mass is changing at a certain rate? You're going to get a force due to that. Do that. And this is not that intuitive. You'll have situations where the mass is changing at a certain rate that will result in a force. 
Okay, what I'd like you to do now is use this idea of conservation of momentum. Let's get back to conservation of momentum. P initial equals P final. And I would like you to solve or to, to do uh, the first example problem on page 255. So please do E1 on page 255. And I'll give you a few minutes to do that, and then we'll move on to the next thing.